hello and welcome I'm partners in crime and you know I always say that in the nicest possible way now today's case is the case of uh, and it's a tragic case I must say and it's an awful case really and it's a case of Millie Dowler now Millie's real name was Amanda Jane Dowler and throughout this I'll be calling her Millie because that's what she's really known by now on the 21st of March 2002 this 13 year old schoolgirl you know was reported missing by her parents about seven o'clock at night actually I think and she because she failed to return home from school um, I think in the train station you could see her getting off the train um, at Watton on Thames in Surrey that afternoon she had not got off on her usual stop she'd got off earlier because she'd gone out for some um, for something to eat after with her school friends and then decided to walk the 30 minute journey home and she never made it and so this is the Millie Dower case so at 3.07 p.m. on March the 21st, 2002, Millie Dowler left her Heathside School in Weybridge, Surrey, and she walked to Weybridge Railway Station with her friends, okay? She disembarked at Walton on Thames Railway Station one stop before her normal stop where she'd get off. And that was, as I said, because she wanted to go and eat at the station cafe with her friends. Now, after that, she called, did call her father and that was at 3.47 p.m. to say that she would be home in about half an hour. Um, the girls had left the cafe at about 4.05 p.m. and Millie then decided to walk home on her own. She was last seen about three minutes later after that walking along Station Avenue by a friend of her sister's and she was um, waiting at the other side at, on the bus stop. By the time that she had got on the bus, Millie had disappeared. Because as the bu bus came past, Millie was no longer, could be seen anywhere. She just literally disappeared in a matter of minutes. So you had closed circuit TV then, CCTV around, right, in 1982. Not loads of it, but enough around it. I think there was an old building or a building that was used to something else now, but at the time it did have a closed circuit um, CCTV on it, and it was a circular one, so every 50 seconds it would go round. Now, she was seen on certain CCTV, but on this one, when they looked, this girl, within 50 seconds, had gone off of this road. She had gone. Now, a red day you next to her, which belonged to Levi Belfield, girlfriend Emma Mills was also photographed or driving past at the same time at 4.32. Now this becomes relevant much later down the line actually when we look at the evidence here because it took about nine years actually to convict Levi Belfield for the murder of Millie Dowler because there was really no evidence at that point. I think when they, I mean, when you're looking through thousands of hours of CCTV and you're looking for a girl and that's all you're looking for and you can't find her because then you've got no other evidence. You're not looking, then no one was looking for Levi at this time. It wasn't until Levi was prosecuted and charged and prosecuted and put away for, you know, for life or other murders um, that he actually became in the frame of this. But Levi Belfield, um, really if it wasn't for the mother getting caught for the mother murders because he's a serial killer um this case would have still been unsolved really it was once you know what you're looking for on cctv it's easier to find isn't it really so when millie failed to return home it's about seven o'clock actually that her father reported her missing on that evening or her parents did this and this started a nationwide search. Of course, it did. She was a 13 year old girl. There was about 100 police um, officers and helicopters already searching in fields and streets and rivers around Hersham for this, this girl. Detectives who had investigated the induction of Sarah Payne were also on this case because, really, you know, I think even in 2002, when you see a child come out of school, you know, off a train and you, you normal girl, she coming home from school she had rung her dad there was no issues around here you know there was no runaway here not that they could work out um you're, you're then looking at aren't you at foul play and i think yes they may have fought it earlier on but there was issues 
around this case um, from press and different things throughout the time that really hindered this case actually. I must say that, it, I think it hindered it. So of course Millie Dowler's family made many, many appeals for her. They um, wanted her to come home. They, they just did so many of these TV appeals, really. Um, they'd done also a reconstruction of her on BBC Crime Watch. Um, I think this the Popeye of the winner, I don't really know, Will Young, and he's great Will Young, and Millie had been to a concert just a few days before her disappearance, and um, he actually put out for an appeal as well. Everyone was trying everything. So the Crime Watch also included a direct appeal to uh, Millie in hope that she was a runaway and that she would come home, even though, as I say, there was no actual reason to even feel that was part of it. But when you're looking for a child of 13 who's just gone missing, you have to look at every angle, and I think this is what the police did. People just tried to think of everything because there was no evidence, was there, at this point that Millie had been abducted. Not at all. And I think the character of Millie is what was known. And the police, I think this is why the police also thought that maybe it wasn't foul play. Because of her being 13, she was quite a character, actually. She was, um, they, they sort of, she understood the dangers, should I say, what we call stranger danger. But I think when you're taught this danger, you know, stranger danger at school, you know, don't go into a car, don't do this, don't, you know, are you expecting the predator then to ask you when he may have? Or are you expecting the predator to grab you, to not give you a chance? So I don't think we should ever, when a child goes missing, just because we think they won't get into someone's car, that they're not taken anyway. And this is exactly, I think, what happened in Millie's case. She didn't go near the car. She was taken by force. And the reason I say that is because now we know the facts we now know that he did it right Levi Belfield did it but we also now know that the day before Millie Dow disappeared he had tried to abduct another child he had pulled up in the same red car and the child he called her over and said I'm your new next door neighbour would you like me to give you a lift home now this girl had enough sense and she was far enough from the, the car she said, no, I'm fine, thank you. I can walk. Now, she ran home and told her mum, and her mum reported that to the same police that are now looking for Millie Dower. Now, that report was there, okay? It was there, but no one followed it up. Now, the next day, I don't think he asked Millie Dower, I'm your new neighbour, do you want to get in my car? And I think that's why he grabbed her. This time, he weren't having any chances and this kid saying no and running away. Now listen, and I've said it a lot with people like these perpetrators, like Levi Belfield, if it hadn't have been Millie Dowler, it would have been someone else. Now the girl on the day before had a lucky escape and we sort of bring her into this a little bit down the line. She had a lucky escape because this was a dangerous man. He was well known to like children. He was a nasty piece of work. He actually didn't like women at all, and he certainly didn't like blonde women at all. He hated them, really hated them. And the other girls that he attacked were blonde. So this man was a dangerous predator, and so that's why I think he just literally took her off the street, and it was seconds. The girl didn't know what had happened. It was 50 seconds, remember, from when the CC camera saw her to when they saw nothing. 50 seconds. Terrible. Now, following this extensive search and everything else, Millie Downer's body was found, I think, on the 18th of September in Yatley, um, Heath Woods, in Yatley in Hampshire. Her body was naked, her, and there was actually no DNA to tell the truth, there wasn't. So there was no clothes at the scene. Her bag wasn't there, her school bag wasn't there, her rucksack wasn't there, her phone wasn't there, nothing was there. Um, her body was decayed, really so badly um, that there was no real way that you could tell the cause of death. So you can just imagine, can't you, what this girl suffered at the hands of this evil man. He's just so evil, this man, you wouldn't believe it. But that's when her body was found. But the case doesn't end there, you see, 
because they may have found the body, but as I said, there's no DNA. They didn't catch Levi for this crime for, you know, nine, nine and a half years later. But Levi done quite a lot more in this crime, really. But also there's a lot more to Minnie Dowler's family, what happened throughout this. It's a shocking case this for many, many reasons. I mean, just remember these people have lost a child and then they have to put up with a load of crap, really, from people that want their 15 minutes of fame. Shocking. I mean, the first thing, <laughs> really, that happened to the Downer family was that the father was a suspect right from the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, and I say this is all cases, you, you, you know, the police are looking at everyone and, you know, no one wants to say that a father's not going to do it, let's be honest. Right, we've had many cases that they have but they apologised to him in the end. On the 23rd of March 2003, the DNA was identified of a male and covered on um, Millie Dowler's um, bedroom, in her bedroom. But again, there was other issues with that, so they, don't forget they're still looking for a killer because it's been nine, you know, nine and a half years it took to get Levi. But that again was um, no one really, I, I think it was a thief, or they thought it was a thief that had break into the house, this sort of stuff. But it wasn't anything to do with Millie. But they tried everything, these police. They really did try. So here's where all the weirdness starts with this case, do you know? This is the sort of things what happen. So, Paul Hughes. Now, he was convicted of making death threats and jailed for five years after sending letters to Millie Dowler's sister, threatening to kill her and claiming that he'd killed Millie. I know. Now, Hughes had sent letters while being in prison <laughs> for indecently assaulting a 12-year-old. Now, the prison service apologised for these letters because they were sent from a prison and that they hadn't then gone over these letters before he sent them out. Uh, shocking, really. But this is just part of what this family had to put up with. Now, Leah Newman from Gloucestershire repeatedly phoned the Dowler's parents, school, and the police pretending to be Millie Downer. Newman was jailed in April 2003 for five months for pleading guilty to five counts of making phone calls and causing annoyance, inconvenience and needless anxiety. I don't know what's wrong with some of these people. Gary Fur, right, from Northamptonshire, repeatedly emailed the Downer family, the parents, friends, the police officers um, on working on the case, claiming that Millie had been struggled, uh, smuggled out of the country for work as a prostitute and a stripper at a nightclub in Poland. <sighs> now, and he alleged that everything was this big cover-up. The family knew about it. This is what he kept um, doing. Now, Far was sentenced, um, was actually sectioned actually indefinitely under the Mental Health Act on the uh, 19th of October 2006 for being a serious psychological danger to the public after admitting um, a charge of harassment. Now, in March 2008, a man was arrested over the disposal of the car linked to the murder investigation, the red uh, car, uh, saloon car, but he was also released um, that day without charge. Because I've said we're looking for this red car, and this is what Levi had drove, this red car, and this was his girlfriend's car at the time. Yes, this man even had a girlfriend at the time of doing all these murders and God knows what else he was doing. So in October 2009, um, the, I think it was in um, Bedford or Bedford uh, Lakes Country Park in West London was searched by police because this car has still to this day never been found. They never found this car. They've looked everywhere, they've never found it. Um, I think um, as we go into more of the details about how he's arrested and why he's arrested, you can see why the importance of this car really comes into it. So on the, I think, 25th of February 2008, Surrey Police confirmed that Levi Belfield was their prime suspect. Now, there was a lot of issues around this case because where Belfield had this girlfriend who owned this red car, she lived at a different property. It was noted that Belfield lived where Millie Dowher walked by where she was gone in them 60 seconds, there's a block of flats. Now the flats were there and there was a walkway, because you couldn't see it from the street. And that was where Millie Dowler, they believed, that was taken back to that property. That's where he saw her. 
the car, the red car, was what drove or parked around the corner. And um, when they was looking now on CC camera film footage for anything to do now with Belfield, they saw the same red car come out. And that's how they knew and they linked it. So they needed, because they know that he murdered her then, he also went back to his girlfriend's about 11 o'clock that night. And then he said to him, he got up early hours in the morning, so I've got to go back to the flat. He went back to the flat where they believed that Millie Dowler was murdered there. And he's either cleaned up the property and disposed of the body then. That's what he's done with Millie's body. So we don't know. Now the girlfriend said when she went there the next day to check the flat, she believed that he had a girlfriend in there or something in there, someone else, another woman in there. Because all the bed sheets and everything was gone, he had said that the dog had messed on the bed sheets and that's why he got rid of all the bed sheets. But when she checked in the bin areas of these flats, there was no sheets to be found. He had destroyed every bit of evidence there was, really. This man was a very clever man, really. But nasty, but clever. Um, and I think where they found Millie's body was literally only by mistake because the part of the wood that they would have found her, it wasn't really a walking path. You had to cross a stream to, to go and find it. And it was um, mushroom pickers that she found her body. She may never have been found. Now it turns out this Yadley Wood in Hampshire, he knew. So we should try to put a case together about this man the links between him and Millie. One, the links were, one, he lived in the same, or right there actually, there, um, within seconds of her where she disappeared. The two that he did drive a red car and that's what they was looking for. The third part is that an ex-girlfriend or an ex-wife had, when she heard about all these killings and stuff going on, not about Millie Dowler, about other killings that he had done, and we'll go through them in a minute, that she rang the police and said, listen, I think it's him, because at the time he was driving a white van. And that's how he then become under suspicion for Millie, it was only through his links for that. Now, when they found Millie's body in this Yatley Wood, his ex-wife, the one that reported him and said that she thought he was a serial killer of these other girls, used to do horse riding there, he knew that area and he'd take her dogs for a walk and he would stop, he'd walk up as far as his path bit and then he'd cross over to the river and he'd stop there, he wouldn't carry on, he wouldn't go further, he never went back to that crime site. He used to walk the dogs and walk her up this path, stop and turn back. He would never go any further. And I've always said that these, you know, predators like to return to the crime that they're seeing. So there was another link between him and Millie, the place where Millie was disposed of, her body disposed of, he knew and you'd only know that area if you'd been there a lot, you would, you know, he had to know it. So there was the links between him. Now the thing is with the police, um, there was a lot going on wasn't there at this time, you had a lot going on with the papers because you had now, this family had been through so much, now he's been arrested for this murder, we now have the claims also come out that, um, phone hacking of Millie's phone by the News of the World paper and that was true, you know, they did, they hacked her phone. You've hacked a phone of a 13 year old dead girl, really, and this is what took this paper down in the end, really. Now, it was said that the messages on the phone were deleted, that the reporter, not the reporter, I think the investigator, it was a private investigator who had done the searches and then sold the material, made a lot of money, actually by phone hacking these phones and selling stuff. So you know, the the press, these, these people have made a lot of money, you know, or uh, this private investigator that hacked this phone has made a lot of money, I think, from hacking people's phones and selling the information to newspapers. And there were some serious phone numbers on this. I think there was hundreds and hundreds of, news, of um, phone numbers on this man's list of what they'd hacked and this, that and the other. Um, which were private conversations, uh, very high profile. And I think when they raided this private investigator's property, they found lots of files and Millie Dowler's phone number and stuff was in that. But the man didn't delete the messages. He did look at the messages and he did hack into her phone and he did take the messages from it. 
but he didn't delete any messages. Um, Millie Dowler's phone was set up to delete every 72 hours anyway. But what this did to her poor family, you see, is that when they was leaving messages for Millie, and it was daily, you know, it was always going to voicemail because the message box was full. One day, they've rung up again, this is the parents, to try and say, you know, come home, we love you, this, that and the other. The message went through, so they really thought that their daughter was alive. So this is the issue here. Not the phone hacking, right, that is an issue. That's a legal issue, because at the time, let's be honest, this daily you know, news, whatever it was called, uh, News of the World, um, it was called, and other papers at that time, believed that they were above the law. You cannot hack someone's phone. You know, you can't, just for a story, you can't do it. Now the issue also with this News of the World, what I have an issue with, is because the night that Millie Dowler, this killer, Levi Belfield, was going to be arrested for this because the police had watched him. Now, listen, the police talk like everyone else. There's leaks, leaks, leaks going on and it's always from the police you're going to get them, right, really. People talk. But the news of the world rung them up, threatened them. We're going to release the story. We're going to release it tomorrow that you're going to arrest Levi Belfield for this murder of Millie Dowler. Now, they couldn't jeopardise this case. So what they had to do was come to some agreement with this news of the world to take them along on the arrest, give them, you know, the story. I mean, the problem is with this news of the world, you're meant to report the news. What they were trying to do was solve crimes. That's what they're trying to do, to get the next scoop, to be better than anybody else. I mean, they hindered this case actually, in such a way, most of the time. They invaded the privacy of this family. Oh, it's no wonder this, this, this company went down. They needed to be. It needed to be stopped. And after that, the laws have changed now a lot, have enforced, because the laws were there before, they just weren't being enforced, to tell you the truth. The police were letting them get away with it. The, the police, I think, were a bit scared of them, because the news of the world held a lot of power here for about 30 years, and it was a Rupert Murdoch newspaper. It held a lot of power here. And so they needed to have this stopped. And the Millie Dowler case really took an end to that. So these you've got these big high profile, you know, reporters and editors and stuff that really lost their jobs, but also lost their credibility. It's really shocking, really, to think what they did in this case and the damage they caused to this family. Heartbreaking, really. So let's get back to Belfield and this murder, shall we? So, Belfield's trial began on the 10th of May 2011, and this was the criminal, as uh, in the Central Criminal Court, and um, before Justice uh, Winkley. Now, it concluded, I think, in June 2011, and the jury found him guilty because what the police have had to do is now they're looking, as I said, for the CC evidence. They've got it. This man, I'm telling you now, wasn't admitting nothing. He'd already been charged, had he, with other murders, and we're going to go through them now. But he didn't want to be known as the person that murdered Millie Dowler. She was 13. Now, he was sentenced to life in prison, and the following day, the trial judge recommended that he will have a whole life tariff in line with the previous murder convictions uh, three years earlier. Right, so he, he got... A whole life sentence. I think at the present there's about 90 convicted criminals in England who are so who are serving whole life sentences because this man cannot be let out. He's very very dangerous man. Now the trial also of Belfield brought in the charge of attempted abduction of the young girl. Remember the day before Millie went missing. Now her name was Rachel Cowles, I think. And she was 11 year old, 11 year old. What a lucky escape this 11 year old had because I don't think she was close enough to the car. You know, she wouldn't go close. She ran, no, and ran. Lucky she did. But again, that was not brought up. That wasn't looked at when it come to looking into this case. 
that you had an abduction or attempted abduction the day before of a man in a red car. If then they'd been looking at the man in the red car in this investigation, it would have probably come out earlier that he had done it because then they would have looked at the CCTV from where Millie disappeared and found that the red car was there as well and that then would have linked him. Also this flat of Belfields, right where Millie was taken from, was, um, I think the police knocked on that door 11 times, 11 times to speak to that person, left messages through the door, he never responded but they never followed it up. They never followed it up. If they had, again, that may have made a difference and may it wouldn't have saved Millie, she was already dead, but it would have may have saved the others that died after her. Now I think with Belfield, his other murders, well it's a French girl and uh, another girl, um, he battered them on the head with a um, hammer till they were dead um, and you'd see him, I think with the cameras in London, even at that time on the buses, so a lot of these girls were getting off bus and killed near bus stations as was Millie actually, killed near a bus station or a bus stop should I say. Um, and he just literally got out of the car. I think another one that was done for attempted murder, he actually ran the girl over multiple times in his van and she survived. He thought he'd killed her. She survived. He had this thing, and these were older girls, you know, 19, 20. Uh, he had this thing for blonde girls. He didn't like women and he certainly didn't like blonde haired women at all. But he really had a thing for children. And, um, you know, he was a. <laughs> A vicious, horrible, nasty man. Now, the thing is, when he goes to court, you see, and he went to court for Millie's murder, he was, again, because the, the, you know, the court don't want to be prejudiced against him, you have to, case by case, isn't it, basis. They, you know, he, I suppose the jury would have known certain things about his crime, but it wasn't brought up. Um, he was only there on the murder of Millie and the evidence then relating to, to that case. Um, so the jury wasn't, this other murders and stuff that he had done because he's a serial murderer wasn't brought into it. But what I think the Downer family have said about the process that they went through, and this is a really big point here, is that these people were what I call secondary victims. They'd lost their 13 year old child to this monster. We don't know what happened to her, but we can imagine. They then got into court because this man's not going to plead guilty. I think in one stage he said he did, then he retracted it and stuff. Like, you know, he wasn't going to admit nothing. If you wanted this man, you're going to have to actually find all the evidence and prosecute him. He wants his day in court, really. He does. And that's exactly what he got. But the prosecution, you know, really, you know, defamed, uh, I think, Millie Dowler's name. Uh, this girl was 13. Now, I know prosecution have got to do the prosecutors have got to do the job. I know that. But this family felt like they were on trial. It, they really did. It really destroyed them, this. They'd lost their child to this man, and they are the ones that left that call, even though he was convicted, feeling like they were guilty of something. They had been literally, you know, dragged, their whole life had been dragged through a court, and then most of it was untrue. Then they had been abused there by their, you know, you know the, the, his defence team to go as far as they did. I just, I just don't know. I don't know if they did need to that to do that. This man was already a murderer, what did they want to do? Get him to all free? Like, you know, and you're going to take down a 13 year old child in the process, her memory of her and her family and her life, you're going to destroy it even more? Shocking really. So they really left and felt really, really terrible actually about this and I don't think they've ever got over it. I don't think they've ever got over the loss of Millie, but I think they haven't got over that either. The way they was treated and made to feel the life out there to everyone. Terrible. So the Downer's parents, Millie Downer's parents, Sally and Bob Downer, launched a charity actually called Millie's Fund on the day of her memorial service in October 2002. Its mission was to promote public safety and um, in particular the safety of children and young people. Because don't forget, this girl was only walking home from school in a very nice area of London, really, 
and she was gone in 50 seconds. They felt they needed to do something. Uh, the charity provides um, like risk assessments and staff to advise teenagers and youth workers and educators on the best way to keep our children safe. Their works included a Tech You Are Mum uh, TXT uh, campaign which encouraged children and parents to stay in contact via text messaging and you know you have the codes and all that now you can use and, in, and they, they sort of made up glossaries and stuff you know pamphlets for parents which is um, commonly used with SMS abbreviations so it's like code words and stuff very good actually really good and you'll find a lot of these families that have lost children like this they really try to make sure this doesn't happen again to anybody else so the campaign was awarded the best use for mobile assess um, accessibility in 2004 and the GSM Association Awards. So they've done really well. Millie's Fun con conditioned to make a five-part soap opera titled Watch Over Me in 2003, which encourages personal safety for teenagers um, to be distributed into every school in the UK. Very good. And in 2005, the family announced that the charity would now transfer now to the Susie Lampu Trust. Now we've done Susie Lampu and we've said about the incredible work, what her family have done. You know, this girl has never been found, has she Susie? At least Millie has been found and been put to rest. So what a wonderful way for them to end really and allow to get on with their life now and to put this now into the trust of Susie Lampu's trust and continue that work like that. And um, it's amazing really, isn't it? When you think that people that have had such loss can do so much good. Now, Levi Belfield will spend the rest of his life in prison where he belongs. He was an absolutely danger to our society. He was certainly a danger to the children and to young women. We don't know what other crimes Levi Belfield has done, do we? We can just imagine. Because we know Levi Belfield was hardly called for this one. It took work. What else has he done? Just have to wait and see what comes up. So this has been the Millie Downer case. Tragic case, isn't it really? Shocking case. But at least she's found and at peace. So thank you for watching. You know what to do. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Thumbs up. I should really say this thumbs up earlier on, but thumbs up. <laughs> um, if you found this case interesting, you can follow this on Instagram and on Facebook. And also this will be on a podcast on Spotify as soon as I have the time to do it. So thank you to all my partners in crime. Thank you for watching. Again, the list of names will be at the end of each of my videos. So until the next time, take care. Bye-bye.